In late 2017, mustard gas was found in Lincolnshire. The discovery posed a very real threat to public safety. At the heart of the response were the military's regional liaison officers. But they have to be ready to help with anything. When disaster strikes, the emergency services must work together to save lives quickly, efficiently and safely. Who can walk? Hey. Everyone who can walk away. In these crisis situations, the armed forces are often called in to provide support, expertise and manpower. Coordinating and organising these complex operations is the work of regional liaison officers. It's day one of a major air crash exercise at RAF Syaston in Nottinghamshire. All the emergency services will be taking part, alongside the Army and Air Force. The planning team has simulated the aftermath of a mid-air collision between a commercial aircraft and a glider. The wreckage has fallen onto the A46, killing and injuring many people travelling on the dual carriageway below. The scenario has been written to test worst case scenario today. Uh, it, if this ever happens, it would be a very bad day in anybody's book. For exercise purposes, obviously we've had the uh, disused runway drawn out, so it looks like the um, dual carriageway. The glider will crash on site and uh, it will be the multi-agency response to dealing with those two disparate crash sites and the uh, uh, resulting pandemonium. The scene the emergency services find when they arrive will be extremely realistic. Drama students have been brought in from a nearby college to act as casualties. Am I having the nails in as well? You're having a nail oh, in your Yeah. Um, I'm currently going to be getting a nail in my eyes, so I'm not going to be able to see. I can't see at the minute anyway, so it's, as I say, it's quite frustrating anyway. So we're going to have a nail in there as well, so I'll have to scream a bit. It's taken us uh, almost a year to, to uh, plan this exercise. We sat down in about June last year and pitched this to both the Royal Air Force and to our uh, civil partners, all of which were really, really keen to go for a full three, four day exercise to test every facet of aircraft post-crash management from the blue light response right the way through to aircraft post-crash management which is clearing up the wreckage, clearing up the cars. I, I'm estimating that we're going to have about 600 people on site today. We've got all the emergency services here, the Royal Air Force will attend, but these exercises don't happen very often. So we've got a visitor program for the observers to come through so they can witness what would happen if they were in that situation and presented with the accident you're going to see later. Both aircraft have crashed. The glider you can see right that way right out on the far side of the airfield and we know that we've got one fatality and one casualty in the glider. Both the Army and Air Force regional liaisons for the East Midlands are taking part. Lieutenant Colonel Andy McComb is in charge of coordinating the arrival of the emergency services at the scene. We're at the assembly area for all the blue light responders who are going to be deploying in about half an hour onwards onto the incident scene. It's important that they don't all turn up at the same time, so we've created this sort of assembly area here where I'll give them a safety briefing, briefing about the objectives, what time they're going to be leaving, and then assuming the exercise starts on time at 10 o'clock, then my job is to make sure that the right vehicles leave from here at the right time, know the route they've got to take, whether it be eastbound or westbound, so they arrive at the incident scene in a realistic fashion. Good morning and welcome to Exercise Silver Siren. I think once they actually get to the scene itself and see about 100 civilians, casualties, um, walking wounded, people just affected by the incident, they will be wrapped up in the whole incident. We ran a similar exercise in Rutland last year of a similar scale. And as soon as you're actually surrounded by real crashed vehicles, a simulated road, a lot of people calling out and shouting, they get totally into the scenario and they forget it's an exercise. Okay. So we're, we're, we're going to go. We're going to go. Yeah, okay. Exercise, 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 crash, DI. Yeah, crash, come in. 
we have a incident down the field in front of the winch. Someone please help! Please dispatch immediately to that location. Copy that, I'll move. Come on! Please! Walk your wounded on me, please. Everyone who can walk on me! What's your name, brother? James! James, right. Clearly you've got something in your eyes. Yeah, I've got the wound. Let me cover it. Yeah, got you right. Do you need this one, Mike, like real world, um, are we likely to get the helicopter? Do you know? Uh, we're phoning it in the next 10 minutes. So okay. 11 o'clock. Who, who's, who's making that call? The meal. He's going to make the call. Yeah, so if you would like to make your way to the incident ground, there's been a major incident declared. So we've got about 150 casualties uh, simulated out there. Some of them have quite interesting roles. Some of them have really horrific injuries um, that uh, the crews have got to deal with. Um, if you just simply look to my left for, for a moment, uh, they are now in the process of extracting casualties. Uh, you can actually see that they're, they're actually going to have to cut some of the casualties out of the vehicles. As well as that, we've got role players that are providing witnesses, they are providing survivors, they're providing helpers. Some are not quite so helpful, if you know what I mean. Please to steer. He's a, he's a guide steer for you, mate. Help okay. me. Uh, they're coming in and causing the emergency services problems. Um, these, these are all real world issues that uh, the civil emergency services have to deal with. I could sing you a song, I could. I need you to understand that you shout to the raven, he's making a lot of people feel very uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Appreciate your concern. Will you take a seat for me? Will you do that for me? I'll try to. I've not, I've not got a bit of the best of that. Do your best. Do your best. I'll just keep yourself there. Stay here. Right, I've got it. Adding to the complexity of the situation, there's an unknown substance on the carriageway. Everything we've done is to meet a training objective of one of the responding organisations. Nottinghamshire Fire Service wanted to test a white powder incident. There is a white powder out there, they don't know what it is yet. So they have to put in certain precautions to allow their operatives to work safely in those sort of conditions. They'll very quickly find out it's actually flour. But when they approach the scene, they don't know that, and they have to take every precaution to protect themselves. What you're seeing here is the initial response. This is the emergency services response. OK, anybody speaking? Just stay calm, we're here to help you. A telephone call was made to the Chief of the Defence Staff's duty officer in London. Now, his job is to go through a checklist and call out a, a huge amount of... Uh, MOD response organisations to assist with the, with the scene here. Uh, one of which will be RF Coningsby. Right now we've got an aircraft that's crashed. We need to get people uh, uh, sort of protected, not least, you know, the, get the survivors out of, uh, out of the way and then we need to protect the scene. It is, until we're told otherwise, a crime scene. Oh, please help me! Please! Listen, 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 listen. Calm down, right? We've got another fire engine coming up and we're going to get you all out, OK? Okay, just relax. Right, so it's now just gone half past two. Um, as you can see behind me, it's calmed down quite a lot now. Um, we've moved now from the recovery phase of the exercise. So all the casualties that we, uh, that we had on site have now been simulated, taken away to the hospitals, either by ambulance or, or air ambulance in some cases. Uh, all the survivors have now been moved to a survival reception centre. We've done a short debrief with each of the uh, three emergency services and everybody's got a huge amount out of this. From the police side, we're very pleased. My role today was umpiring, so trying to look at how the police activity went, particularly in the multi-agency arena, so looking at how uh, police, fire and ambulance and the military work together. So really pleased with the way that's gone. We have a really good relationship with the military locally. Uh, we know our JRLO and our RAFLO really well. So we're always working together as planners. Um, the difference, I suppose, today is actually putting boots on the ground and working together um, actually at an incident scene. It is absolutely vital that we can do as much training as we like back in the classroom, but until you see the realism of what it's actually like and how you actually deal with a major incident, multi-agency incident, there's nothing quite like it. For the RAF, the work has just begun. 
to protect the scene and later to clear the site. Armed Forces Regional Liaison Officers are called on when a major incident requires military assistance. When you get the guys out, uh, all their kit, uh, into the, um, that, that sort of compound area. Quite often it's an extreme weather event like flooding, so there are regular exercises working alongside other agencies to make sure everyone knows what to do in the case of a real emergency. Here, the Army is practising putting up flood barriers at Pittsford Water in Northamptonshire. Well, we've run this exercise today as a precursor to our annual command post exercise. Each of the Army Infantry Brigade, or each of the regional points of command, as we call them, have to run a one or two day command post exercise each year and to, uh, to provide civil resilience training. Um, we've chosen Northamptonshire, we approached Northamptonshire this year to see if they'd play with us on our exercise, which we're running at the end of this year. So the purpose of today was to create some scenario developments and also to allow some of the local population, flood wardens, environment agencies to get together and actually see how we put up flood barriers and deal with flood problems. If we've got, as we have here, quite a lot of people on the wet side, yeah. Yeah? And we're doing this and we need to get them back over there. Rather than scrambling over, yeah. if you put your next one in, but put it under this one, put that one on there first. What about under this one, yeah? Under that one. Pop it it's been great. I mean, it was a bit too sunny this morning. It was supposed to be simulating severe weather uh, through a severe storm at the end of this year, but it did rain on us at some point. It was amazing how quickly the flood barriers were put up, and uh, I think the troops benefited from some background information about the logic of where they choose to put them, and they've seen now firsthand, if they have to deploy this winter, how quickly and practical these flood barriers are. These regular drills means everyone knows their roles when a real emergency happens. A lot of my day-to-day -day job is very routine. It is attending meetings where we talk about incidents, what might happen in the future, is planning, it's exercising. And actually, particularly this year, it's been a very busy year for me because we had a tidal surge on the East Coast back in January, and, yet, and that was Lincolnshire, spookily enough. And we deployed a couple of hundred troops from a UK standby battalion into uh, coastal towns in Lincolnshire to knock on people's doors to warn them there is a major surge coming. It's just a little concern that this area has been identified as a vulnerable area. But after exercises and public information work, forces TV cameras are on hand as the military get called in for a very real brush with danger and their own past. At Rooton Moor Wood in Lincolnshire, two people have been injured after accidentally digging up canisters of mustard gas. Even in small doses, this highly toxic chemical weapon can cause blistering to the skin, temporary blindness and breathing difficulties. The wood is a popular area for dog walkers and other members of the public, so an immediate response is needed. An investigation has begun and a joint team led by the police, including the EOD, the Army's bomb disposal experts, emergency services, the Environment Agency, Public Health England, the local authority and the landowner have come together to coordinate the clean-up effort. The site has been described as particularly difficult to maintain a cordon on. Yeah. Um, we've put the, the barrier tape, because uh, may make a difference, it may not, um, and, and we've got the best presence that we can, sort of given the advice that we've got. Um, we've increased the, the number of officers that are working around the cordon overnight. Um, I, I cannot say that it is a, um, a perfect uh, cordon. Um, but at the same time, I can say that I think it's proportionate and appropriate. So um, I, think, I think that's probably the best that I can reasonably achieve at this time. Over the weekend, we were getting emails from Andover, the Standing Joint Commander, telling us that EOD had been called. The incident was being centred around what was REF Woodall or RF Woodall Spa. So that was why and the Lincolnshire element and the RF element came in. So they contacted Jim initially because they were thinking this incident was linked to former munitions left by the Air Force. So it made sense that Jim started deploying and started being the liaison. As things developed and it looked like it was going to be a protracted op, Jim rang me and said, actually, we need to start working on this together. For, from my perspective, it was an understanding piece. We needed to appreciate what the situation was and that work could only really be done here. So sat down at the table with the experts, with the silver commander, <coughs> go through exactly what they required, what they needed, what they thought they needed, 
and then the process starts from there. So in uh, close coordination with uh, Air Command from my perspective and Brigade from Anders' perspective, we start calling in all the expertise and in this case uh, EOD was you know, a key player in this. We wouldn't, wouldn't normally get involved in these because I mean, the EUD teams deploy every day finding old hand grenades in Grandad's shed, um, munitions when doing a building site. We sometimes get an email saying it's happening if it's going on, but we don't normally actually turn up and tape up. But because this is enduring, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously quite a challenge and it could go on till next week. We decided, yeah, we need to be here because you know, we need to find accommodation. Normally the teams come and go within a few hours. Um, we've also been able to use our local knowledge. I know a lot of local people and, I know, and I've discovered that some of them are historians and they've come along this evening with aerial photographs from 1947 and showed it was a, a, a very short notice army base where a whole load of infantry gathered and trained before they went off into D-Day. And um, I was quite amazed this wooded area that we're dealing with was a huge complex of accommodation bases, live fire ranges, where everybody came in for a few months and then went over to France. Uh, it would be particularly useful if you can give us the, the short presentation. Simon and I have had a conversation on the phone this morning. I, find it, I found it really informative to, to kind of set the context and understand why the maps that we've been looking at have shown uh, RAF Woodall and, and, and premises south of the lane, and we've got quite a lot of, of information there, but actually the, the area that we were really interested in, uh, relatively little. But I think Simon can probably add some context to that. Thank you. This is one aerial photograph found as part of the historical research your area of interest is up here, and Simon will explain more. Thank you very much. What you had historically, as Erin says, you had the thing with the 1st Air Landing Brigade, three infantry battalions, glider-borne infantry, two of them based within the confines of these camps, the third one billeted in local houses. In enhanced imagery, there's an awful lot of pockmarks in the ground around here. The British Army hastily stockpiled weapons like mustard gas near the end of the Second World War in case they needed to repel a German invasion of the UK. Some of it wasn't disposed of properly and is now reappearing, causing a danger to the public. That's what you've dug up. Uh, it looks like a um, surplus box of ammo that's been loosely deactivated by tipping concrete on it and buried. I have never done this and nobody has, which is fascinating. And we are pulling together so many different sorts of EOD team. Uh, we're dealing with history, which we've never had to do before. We're dealing with repatriating land that was a huge training area in the Second World War, which nobody even knew about. And the police, have their eyes have opened. They hadn't realized what was on their doorstep. So I think this one is about information gathering and smoothing the waters and explaining it was a long time ago. We can sort it out and maybe in a couple of weeks time, We'll be back to normal. The second scene is Stixwold Lake. As well as the woodland site where the canisters were found, there's a second location, Stixwold Lake, where it's thought there could be more mustard gas. In order to find out, Navy divers have been brought in. But they can't go in until they know whether there's mustard gas in the water. Samples have been sent to the DSTL, the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, for testing. The naval dive team uh, went out in a boat um, and they took samples um, from the area that had been pointed out so that we were quite localised to where we think these items are. Um, they collected two samples from the bottom, two samples from the top, uh, and they also collected a test sample from an adjacent lake as well that could be sent off. While the divers wait for the go-ahead, they get a visit from battalion headquarters to find out how the operation is going. I'm very impressed by the professional standards the Royal Navy have shown. I mean, they are taking it very carefully, which is absolutely right. They've got all the right kit. And when they get the correct advice from DSGL and others, then they'll hopefully get in the water and recover these, uh, whatever's been dropped in the water. I think we've had a fantastic response to what's happened here. Um, we not only have people deployed on the ground who are assisting with recovery operations to, to make things as safe as possible, but we've got people deployed within command units which are really helping in terms of our decision making. That's smoothed by having someone who is a liaison officer. Um, what we find is that it's build the relationships in slower time so that when we have incidents such as this, which have required a real step up in our response over a very short period of time, it all runs that much more smoothly. The JRLOs are a really important part of this. I mean, they are here all the time and it, they understand exactly what the police and other agencies want and they essentially are, my eyes and ears, forward on the ground. They 
give the headquarters the, the word what may be being asked for and then we can use that information to start preparing and wait for the formal request to come down through the Home Office into the MOD and then down at the headquarters before we task people. Once the dive team was finally cleared to enter the lake, they found and removed 10 more canisters of mustard gas. A total of 150 were found at the lake and woodland locations. We're now into what I would term more of a sort of steady state. We're now into sort of the support to the EOD guys on the ground and now looking towards the future. Um, obviously we need to deal with what we can see here and now and deal with that as best as we can and then we're now looking towards a what we would term as a return to normality so that will be a separate meeting that will be chaired by a separate organisation we will still be part of it but it is that longer process to return the, the sites that we've already identified back to public use. In the end the area was closed for seven months and three tonnes of soil was removed the work on this incident done, the regional liaison officers return to normal duties and training, so they're ready for the next crisis call.